Hello everyone, I'm Brady Volpe, founder of the Volpe Firm and Nimble This. Welcome to the show. This is episode 64 of Get Your Tech On, our show on all things Doxis. Glad to have you with us. Today we're going to be talking about what's new in PNM and full band capture especially. Uh, we've got two great guests with us today. Uh, first off is John Downey. John Downey, welcome. Glad to have you with us back on. How are things with you, John? What, no catchy moniker or anything? You hey, you know, we're just keeping it simple today. <laughs> good. I'm doing good. All right, thanks. All right. Also with us is Larry Wilcott from Comcast. Larry, it's been a while since you've been on a show. How are things with you? Fantastic, Brady. I, I'm going to apologize up front. I'm super scratchy. I've been talking a lot. We've been doing many expos and lots of talks and stuff in the last couple of days. So I'm a little rough. But um, really looking forward to talking. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I miss you guys. Uh, this is one of my favorite things in the world to do. So I uh, can't, uh, can't wait to talk about P&M. Well, it's definitely a, a good topic and, and a, a favorite topic of all of ours to be talking about. So, you know, Larry, you've been doing a lot of cool things in P&M. We've been talking about some new things in the Ingenious Working Group that, you know, I think yours truly has been really focused on. One of them involves water and coax cable. And I think that's a kind of a, an interesting topic because it's sort of giving us some new visibility in the things that we can determine with particularly full band capture. And so I like, uh, I think that's a nice way of starting this off of what, sort of one of the new things you found. Um, maybe I can throw it off to you and let you sort of introduce that topic. Yeah, thanks, Brady. So um, it's really exciting. Uh, PNM is the gift that keeps on giving, right? So we've been doing full band capture for nearly 10 years. And you know, Comcast and most cable operators anymore, probably 80, upwards of 80 to 95% of their total um, population density of DOCSIS devices are capable of doing full band capture or um, analyzing the full RF spectrum of the coax at the input uh, of the CPE. You know, and just as a refresher, it's, it's basically the equivalent of driving around with a huge spectrum analyzer anytime you want at any end of your line. And, and the power that's <clears throat> amazing. So we've been doing this for a long time and we still continue to learn new things. Um, one thing, and the thing we're gonna talk about today, is it, um, you know, as a side effect, and I'll, I'll talk about the technical details about um, what we've come on, um, but how we got here is we're working on this thing called a passive TDR. It's the ability to use a fully occupied spectrum trace um, using log magnitude bins. That's the, basically the spectrum analyzer output um, without having a lot of complex uh, signal to work with and doing um, interesting math on that to do a Fourier transformation and then um, look at, the time domain um, uh, uh, impulse response of that full spectrum trace. So in short, less mumbo jumbo, it's basically using the fully occupied spectrum as a TDR. And it could tell you, you know, how far away the problems are, what the magnitude of the problems are relative to the signal and some of these other things. <clears throat> and uh, we can, we, um, so in order for this all to work, it's based on um, you know, a lot of the core PNM principles of, um, of impedance matching, micro-reflections and reflective cavities. So if any of you have ever tuned into some of our previous work, you know that you need two micro-reflections to create an impedance cavity of the signal that forms a standing wave. And if you know the velocity of propagation and the type of cable and a few other things, um, time equals distance in cable, so you can calculate the distance to the fault of the impedance cavity. Now, um, so <laughs> So that's all totally legit and it works. So if you have a perfectly good standing wave on your um, on your RF trace and you happen to be jacking in and creating an impedance cavity, you can basically create a standing wave between you and the fault, which can be measured in distance. So that's how you do this passive TDR without actually injecting you know, any signal the way a traditional metallic TDR works. Um, so, so we we have this all coded up. We've got it on several different meters, um, some you know, vendors on their meters. We've done it in software, and it generally works. Um, the problem is we would find standing waves out in the field, and we'd go jack into the plant, and it would be totally wrong. Uh, it would tell us distances and all this stuff, but uh, the footage would be 50% off sometimes, and it was just perplexing. Um, so after doing this and making the same mistakes a couple of times, we, we realized, oh, wait, this standing wave isn't just a standing wave. There's something very unique about it. And we're gonna go into the technical details of this. Very unique about it 
that indicates there's water. And what happens is the water actually slows down the velocity of propagation. So velocity of propagation on a well-known cable is very easy to calculate distance, but we were seeing upwards of 45% reduction in speed of velocity of propagation, depending on frequency um, on certain types of cable when water was present. So lo and behold, we use this uh, to come up with a really killer way to, uh, to determine that there's water in the line. And the reason that this is really particularly important is that in these days of COVID and getting into people's houses and, uh, and social distancing and, and uh, you know, keeping people safe, we were really um, interested in finding ways that were very deterministic at finding problems outside of the home. Um, so if there are, um, and, and the reason that's important, of course, we want to fix problems in, inside the home too. But if we can proactively scan the network right now and to find every home that has water in the drop, we can, and we'll get to how we do that. Um, now you can roll a truck or a, a business partner, contractor, go replace the drop without even having to bug the customer. Of course, you coordinate that so that you're not interrupting their service um, when they need it and, and all this other stuff. Um, but it's really a great opportunity and very timely with what, where we're at with, uh, with social isolation and things like that. So um, I, I know you have some really cool slides that uh, we're going to get into in just a couple minutes about um, about exactly what you want to talk about, exactly what you're talking about. I just want to break down a couple things, some of the content concepts that you just talked about. Um, you know, first of all, full wind capture, and we talked about it numerous times. And that's exactly, you know, we're using a cable modem to see all the RF signals going into the house. And you talked about the TDR aspect about that, but I don't think we've really gotten into that clearly before. So basically, you know, we we get all those RF signals using that full band capture capability in the in the modem. And kind of what you're describing is if there's some type of reflection in there, we get like a standing wave on top of those signals. So it looks like a sinusoidal wave, right? That's that's kind of what we're looking at right now. And and from that, we're able to, we're, we take that standing wave and what you're kind of indicating is we measure that standing wave and we're able to tell the distance of, of maybe where that fault is. So uh, when we, when I worked at uh, WaveTech, Acterna, Bialvi, JDS, whoever they are, um, <laughs> you know, we call it FDR, Frequency Domain yes. Reflectometry. Basically, uh, knowing how a sweep signal works, if you look at the two peaks, and you do 492 times the velocity of propagation divided by the distance in the peaks in megahertz, you'll get the distance in feet um, where the reflection is or the, the distance of the cavity. I assume, uh, Larry, what you guys are doing is getting that distance, then looking at the map to see what makes sense for a cavity distance. And yeah, if it doesn't add up, you could say nothing adds up to my numbers, but if I look at what's a common point for all the modems exhibiting the same problem, then I could say, well, that piece of cable might have water in it because my math is not adding up. That yes and no. So um, so two points. The, the point of the past, yeah, you're spot on. That's how PNM works. Um, uh, and and having inaccurate distances actually kind of helps, but it's easier than that. Um, and uh, the um, let me think about this. Uh, the way that we're doing it um, is the passive TDR. Um, think about it, it's a little bit different. You're not using the cable modems, you're actually using a mobile measurement device or a meter or whatever it is. You're creating one of the micro reflections um, by your, with your test point, and then it's, it's creating an impedance cavity between your location and the actual fault. That's how the passive TDR works. We're gonna talk about something different, um, but the concept of using the signals that are there to do actual distance from your location is based on you physically creating an impedance mismatch, just half of the equation. So yeah, you're right. That's how PNM works though. So on, on top of that, you mentioned being able to identify or target drop lines that might have water. Normally I have a lot of experience with sweeping and balancing and all that stuff, years and years of it. And you know, a loose seizure screw, low end roll off. Water in a passive, high end roll off. So could you look at the full bandwidth capture at the house? And if you saw high end roll off, you could almost assume water anyway, not uh, just from the standing I mean, so 
there's lots of things that cause standing waves, lots of things that cause roll off, lots of things that cause tilt, but this is bulletproof and, I'll, and we'll go through that. Um, but so uh, actually detecting if it's, a, if it's a drop versus feeder is really, really easy. Um, drop lines are isolated to a single premise and, um, uh, and it's, it's really that simple. Uh, in fact, the demo that we're gonna do for Expo it's one drop, one premise, two subscribers in the same house. Uh, like the, uh, the mother-in-law and the family all have their own modem because they didn't want to share because the service was so impaired that they got their own modem. You know, so it's a long story, but um, I still think it just drops the easy part. It's because they're, they're very, very distinctive and they're localized to a single premise, not multiple gotcha. premise. So you guys, if have a, a drop or a feeder. Go ahead. If you're monitoring different houses, only one house exhibits the problem, then there you go, right? Yeah. Okay. Easy peasy, and it's bulletproof. And so we have yet to see, now it's physically possible to get water inside the house if you don't have a drip loop and you've got a steep angle, uh, ascent angle on the, on the drop. It's possible you can get water into the house, but we haven't seen it yet. So um, every single time, you know, we've had an outlet outside that was soaked, not the actual drop, you know, but they're all outside every single time. So that's it's hard to see 100% in this business, and we're so far betting 100. So. What, do you, what do you guys use for the velocity of propagation of drop line? The 0.82? No, no, uh, yeah. eight, uh, eight five, but generally, but I mean, you know, yeah, it, it doesn't matter that much. Uh, but when you when you got water in there, it goes, it cuts in half. <laughs> so. yeah. yeah, and and it while we're while we're on more. velocity of propagation, I just want to make sure that kind of wait for everyone listening. We uh, we set what what is velocity of propagation. So I mean, generally that's how quickly an electrical signal is propagating through our coax cables, right? And and one of the things that you said, Larry, is that water will change how quickly that electrical signal's propagating through the coax cable. And, and so what, you know, why does that matter? And that's what we'll go through in the deck for sure. Um, so the, the, what, okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give a little bit of a teaser here. Um, so the way that coaxial works, it's, a, it's basically just an antenna with a shield around it, right? But it's also a circuit. Um, it, it, it's critically important in order to maintain the, the proper impedance so that you can have the, uh, everything work uh, the way it's supposed to is that the diameter of it seems real simple right oh it's just a single wire it's actually a really precisely formulated single uh, um, uh, center conductor and the ratio of the diameter of that center conductor has to be meticulously maintained to the ratio of the diameter of the dielectric that's that white stuff around it um, and uh, and what happens is when water gets into the line, um, a lot of times uh, rainwater is, um, is a very poor conductor because there's very little particulate materials that it's picking up in the atmosphere, landing on the cable and ingressing into the dielectric. So it's just a very good insulator and that's not what you want ingressing into your dielectric because in effect what you're doing, changing the diameter of the dielectric and other things. There's other phenomena that we're still working on. Um, but that coupled with what we call the spin effect, remember the electrons are actually uh, spinning real fast on the outside, uh, very uh, thin layer of the center conductor. Um, it's creating some uh, phenomena there as well. Um, yeah, but so what happens is we're, go ahead, Barry. No, I was just gonna say, Jason, Jason Roop says, water makes velocity of propagation undeterminable. So. <laughs> Undetermined. So the, the, the way I explain um, coax to people, you know, you're sharing one axis coaxial. Uh, it's really a waveguide. The signal is on that center conductor, but the outer conductor is holding it in. The only thing impeding that waveguide is the stuff in the middle, which is a dielectric. Now, if your dielectric is soaked with water, then obviously you just change the velocity, the, pro the properties of that dielectric. So, I mean, yes. remember the old cable that had the solid like plastic, it wasn't foam at all. That had a, like a, I think a velocity propag propagation of like 0 0.7, 0 0.75. Yeah, it's a lot of different drop cable, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And so um, the way uh, Richard Prodan explained it um, very eloquently was um, the cable itself has a structural return loss. I mean, so if you think about like conservation of energy, you've got um, a couple of things going on. But some of that energy is being reflected, and that's what we call return loss. 
Um, in the second, the diameter of the dielectric and uh, the velocity of propagation get out of whack, you now no longer have a known structural return loss to that cable. So it's, it's, uh, um, it's really a fascinating science experiment. I can't wait to go through the deck. All right. Well, you want to you want to start on that, Larry? Should because I think that really starts to help illustrate for people. And and if you're listening to this on audio, you're not going to get to see the visuals. So I highly recommend for this one, um, if on, on a podcast version, drop in, take a look at some of these slides on the YouTube uh, channel. So yeah, and we'll describe the slides too. Yeah, Maybe some absolutely. Ear candy. Yes, yeah. it is. So right. throwing up the first slide here. All right, read the tea leaves for us, Brady. And so first of all, uh, just so it's obvious and clear, um, there's, uh, this is, these are um, raw network measurements. There's no customer information, no addresses or anything identifiable. Um, these are actual measurements from the network. Can you uh, um, hold up for a second? So Brady, as soon as um, Larry talks and his screen pops back up as the main screen, how do you keep the slide up as the main screen? So, so this is operator error, John. Um, in on your end, you want to pin that to, you want to pin the main screen to your window. And that oh, way, okay. when people talk, it doesn't Maybe cause it. Maybe I will it up for other people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, other Good people job. are just seeing Good the, job, the main screen all the time. Okay. <laughs> yes, all right, sir. thanks. No problem. Okay, so this is a great screen. This one shot basically illustrates the opportunity and the problem uh, really clearly if you've been looking at RF, cable RF boxes for a while. Uh, Brady, read the tea leaves for us, so it's not just me talking. So, uh, I mean, what we're seeing here is um, on the bottom of the screen is the the signature that's on there. Um, so it, it, that's a full band capture from, what is that, the low end, about 54 megahertz all the way up to gigahertz. Um, and then what we see for downstream SNR is uh, most of the downstream channels are bad. The MER we're seeing is like mid twenties uh, that we're highlighting about 25.5 dB MER uh, for the downstream MER, SNR, depending on what you call that. And then the overall signal that we have, uh, what we'd like to see for all the SC QAM channels is a very nice flat line uh, right around the minus 20 dB point there on the chart. But what we're actually seeing is a a what looks to be like a standing wave that start at at the lower frequency. Uh, the standing wave is uh, a kind of a high frequency sinusoidal wave, and then we as we go to the higher frequencies like 500, 600, 700 megahertz, the sinusoidal wave becomes lower in frequency, meaning the 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 periods between the dips are spaced out. In lower frequencies, so I think this goes to what you were saying earlier, Larry. When you have a when you have a standing wave in the frequency response, uh, normally th that that's not impaired by water. Normally, you'd be able to calculate the spacing between each dip within that standing wave, run a fast Fourier transform on that, and then we'd be able to determine in feet. And John, you mentioned this before. Um, you know, in, in practical terms, we've been we've We've worked on this in a field. We could measure the distance between two consecutive valleys uh, within the standing wave. So like I'm, I'm pointing at a valley here, and then I go over to the next valley. We could calculate that distance, and we could say, well, the distance to the fault is X number of feet or X number of meters. However, as we see in this screenshot here, these distances between the valleys change. They get, they get even larger as we go out higher in frequency. And so, Larry, I think that's what you're talking about was the sort of the aha moment you had that said, you know, there's something different in this frequency response compared to normal frequency responses when we have these standing waves. Is that sort of an accurate description? Yeah, nailed it, Brady. Yes. Yeah. So if you look at the frequency, the, the attenuated um, pockets there, it's non-periodic, it's aperiodic. Uh, in a traditional standing wave, we have predictable uh, faults and distances you'll see uh, a very consistent periodic waveform. And the waveforms can vary depending on a couple of different things that are all based in physics. Um, but this, on the other hand, is completely aperiodic. And you might see what looks like a couple of repeating signatures in there, but not for long and not exactly. Um, so the fact that they're aperiodic and they're very extreme pockets of attenuation in certain places of the spectrum, uh, you'll see this when it's clean, 
we're losing literally, I want to say 34 dB in certain places in these really extreme dips. 34, it's lots and lots of, uh, and then in certain other places, you're losing very little or it's nearly none. So if you do a group delay response uh, characterization of this uh, of, across the spectrum, it's all over the place, it's not predictable. So that's the big clue here to say that water is in the mix. And, and while we're on here, so, you know, what is the impact to the end subscribers if, let's say, they're trying to watch a video, uh, you know, lock on to one of these QAM channels that's in a valley? How, what does that, what's the impact to, you know, maybe they, maybe HBO is down in one of these valleys and they want to try to watch one of those HBO channels? Yeah, in this case, you can see um, if they're really, really down, basically if you're below, like, say, the MEG 35, and this isn't, um, power per six megahertz. So when you look at that left power measurement at MEG 20, um, the resolution bandwidth for these scans is like 117 kilohertz resolution bandwidth. So it's not the same thing as you'd expect a DOCSIS or a, uh, any SC quant channel power at six megahertz. Just so, just so you know that. Yeah, um, I was going to ask you about that x-axis. Yeah, yeah, so yeah if, that's, if your uh, RBW that's, is only 100 or 300 kilohertz, so you probably have like a 20 dB correction factor. That's right. Yep. Like and this that. is like 20, I think it's uh, 17. I can't remember what it is offhand, but uh, it's like 17 to 20, um, something like that. But so um, MEG 20 would put you nearly zero received DBMV uh, within a six megahertz channelized power, which is what you want. But here you, you would be basically running 32 or, or a MEG, let's see here, MEG 20. Now you'd be running, uh, these might still work depending on where you're at. Uh, these might be MEG 20. No, they fall off at usually around MEG 15, MEG 17. I mean, they're dead toast. Um, but like you said, Brady, um, um, some of these channels are um, non-tunable. Uh, oh, this OFDM is totally destroyed. Uh, this is, uh, is a 3.1 device, and you can't see it here, but the OFDM was basically unusable. That's at the upper range. So, the OFDM channel is at the upper range between, like, uh, what, 750 and maybe 860 megahertz? Right. And that OFDM channel looks like a sawtooth <laughs> so, or a shark tooth, maybe something like that. So I, I can see why you say it'd be unusable. 20 dB ripple in there. Yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. And, and the power level is so far down. The power level is so far down and it's a very extreme uh, frequency uh, variation. Right. So that's why this would be oh, something yeah. that we would want to correct. 100%. And if you, even if you look at the plain old Dostic, Doxis statistics, a lot of channels there, only uh, five or six of them are actually functioning. Um, most of them are dropping code words like crazy in the, neg uh, um, in the exponential one, you know, basically uh, in the tens of percentiles, if not more. So uh, they're very, uh, very poor performance. The customer experience has got to suck on this. Sure. So now the, the, the opportunity here is now knowing, you know, what is wrong? What is the impairment? and that it's most likely outside of the house and it's uh, isolated to this one customer so right. you can, and it's water that's it's a whole lot of great recon right there and i'm look, i'm looking at this graph and it almost appears like there's a a tighter standing wave underneath the wider standing wave you know i i'm, I'm so what you got that. is a lot of standing waves so um, in the cable there's actually pockets of water that have built up and they create um and leslie ellis put it like this she said larry it's uh, to me that's like trying to try trace a ray of light through a drop of water uh, which is the electrons are similar properties right um they're going to bounce and reflect and attenuate um, all through the uh, spectrum at differently some tight some wide and because there's um probably several, you know, maybe a dozen significant impedance mismatches in this uh, because of the structural return loss of the cable. So it's a great gonna, observation. It's yeah. indeterminate. It's indeterminate. Right. Are you ready for the next slide, Larry? Yeah, sure. All right. Well, and this was uh, the point, um, John's observation, which was spot on. Um, so if you, uh, in our tools, which is killer, you can basically click every house down the street and see the full spectrum trace of this. So you can do a virtual sweep, if you will, by just clicking. Um, and sure enough, it was uh, just this one house. And we uh, we picked it, number one, because it was in serious trouble. And number two, the access was 
uh, fantastic. We just drive up an alley, lift the bucket, uh, boom up to the line, and, it, and we had immediate access, you know, no fences or yards or dogs or anything. Um, so uh, it's pretty obvious when it's just one house on the entire node that has the signature. Yeah, and I, I think that's an important comment that you made. It's kind of, sort of subtle but important because uh, I came up in a conversation the other day of, about using full band capture as as a sweep tool in the plant. Um, so it, it is something that you can actually use, particularly when you get into RPDs, where it is more it is more complex to be able to sweep in an, in a uh, remote FI network. Um, but full band capture gives us that capability to do that very very easily and without having to actually run people out in the plant to do sweep. Yeah, well said. Not not to uh, derail you, Larry, but because full bandwidth capture was touted as another way to see ingress and stuff like that, like LTE and anything over the air, have you found a way to find ingress under those carriers? <laughs> you know, how would you, how would you well, find Well, Joe, you're that? killing me, man. I'm not, I'm not falling for the bait. <laughs> We're talking about water today. Um, <laughs> okay, maybe I did want to derail you. <laughs> you're tricky. I, I know how you operate. Um, so let me give you, let me shortcut you really quick though. I'll tell you the number one way to solve all of that. Don't bother looking for LT energy. You just look for FM ingress and you will get to the place you care about every single time. You know why? Because it's ubiquitous. It's narrow, it's super loud, and it go, it cuts through every little splice and hole in the cable. And if, you, if you're looking for ingress, you just go chase your FM, uh, and it's super easy to detect. And you can even detect which radio stations are getting them. Um, because of the frequency accuracy of the full band capture, I'm telling you, like, you just go fix your FM noise and everything else falls apart. Uh, yeah. So anyway. Absolutely, we see that all the time. All the time. All right. Okay, so um, we, we did interview the customer, and I've been trying to do this a lot um, because that's why we're here. Um, this customer was actually working from home, and uh, they had been there for a couple of months, and her, her service was not reliable, having tons of problems, and she was, like a, I think, a support uh, representative uh, taking calls all day um, on behalf of her employer. And I, I didn't get all that, but um, she was working from home doing support work on the phone. And had tons of intermittent issues. You know, it would go a day or two, be fine, and then she'd have a couple of days where it was just really poor, and a lot of uh, the system would uh, would reboot itself, or it would just glitch, and uh, you know, presumably, you know, renegotiate channel sets and all the discomfort that happens during all this process. Um, they have actually bought their own cable modem and tried swapping it, which I, uh, you know, that's it was uh, so common. Sad, yeah. That's so and common. Swapping so modems. ineffective. Swapping so a ineffective. cable modem. Yeah, unless you got a bad modem, but mo I'm telling you, you got a water soap drop. It doesn't matter <laughs> what you put in there. It's gonna. Um, and they did a lot of self-service attempts. We looked at all of their care interactions, and a couple times a week for the last, you know, quarter, these poor customers were, you know, resetting their own device and like doing all this stuff and speed testing and. Um, uh, we did reset, uh, reset uh, recommend resetting their cable. I'm not sure. So we're going back. Trust me, I'm, uh, I'm uh, double clicking this with all of our care tools and all that. We recommended they reset their cable modem, and we clearly uh, should have identified this. And um, I say a lot of times we do. So we're, this one particular case, we're still drilling into to figure out why. But this should have been a, a truck out to the house without question. Uh, if you just look at the doc, the downstream RF, it's toast. Right. right, it's toast. Um, the only thing we're adding new to the mix here is we know it's water and we know it's just one house. You know, so I think we already knew that. Yeah, you know, I, I think that how critical it is um, with everyone working from home right now in COVID, though, this makes it, this I think really illustrates the point of having that visibility into what this subscriber, what their what their RF signals were like, gives you the visibility to say, yeah, we absolutely needed to roll the truck there. And that's that's really good information to have. You know, it is. One, one scenario I see where a modem change would work is if you move back to a DOCSIS 3.0 modem. <laughs> because then you'd be using different frequencies that might not see the reflection at the very high end, depending yeah, on where your DOCSIS so, carries were. So, John, you're, you're right. And it, actually, resetting the modem has the same effect. It could, the modems are pretty good at renegotiating bonding groups that are unimpaired. 
Um, the, the problem is they were all so badly impaired. They couldn't get a solid block that was wide enough to, to be effective. But you're right. So resetting can actually have a positive effect, but it's temporary. Uh, and, uh, and by the way, the more it rains, the worse it gets. Right? Yeah, well, so it's not and like, another thing on top of that that exacerbates the issue is DOCSIS 3.1 modems, at least from Cisco's perspective, we prefer 3.1 spectrum before we put traffic on the 3.0 spectrum. So if a 3.1 modem is locked on because the PLC is great, it's really robust, it's locked on, and you're already down to profile zero, which is, might be 64 qualm, but you're taking on errors, the CMTS might still keep trying and it's not going into partial mode. My point is right. if I drop to a 3.0 modem, then it's not trying to put any traffic on the 3.1 spectrum because there is no 3.1 spectrum for a 3.0 modem. You understand what I'm saying? Like, oh yeah, for sure. And, and generally, the higher fre higher frequency spectrum you're using, the worse it is when there's water, for sure. So, yeah, yeah, good point. I mean, great way to advocate for the devil. <laughs> we still got it. So, we just a couple comments from the chat room. Um, uh, Double the man says, yeah, he could see water in his line on his SB8200. He could see high frequencies, have super low signals. So he was able just to look at it from that standpoint. Uh, Jason says, good indication of water then. Seems to be easier to see the high signal. Um, so he's just responding back to that. And when it rains, it pours. So a number of people are also nice. looking at the same thing, just looking at their modem and looking from an attenuation standpoint. But I think this capability in PNM is going to be far, far more powerful to be able to deterministically isolate it. So what you found, Larry? Yes. Yeah, so basically, if you look really close at the picture on the left, uh, there's a, that's the drop cable. And the drop cable was actually strung over a power main. And every time the wind blew, it would rub a little bit. So I'll tell you, the, the drop cable was probably a year or maybe, well, it was date stamped two years old. So it was a very new drop. Um, I don't think it was a two-year-old drop. It looked pretty much pristine, um, but the um, the jacket just had the slightest little rub in it. the The shielding was perfectly intact. Just a little bit of the the jacket uh, had a hole in it from rubbing on top of the power main, but it was a very steep incline, um, basically a drop down to the house, and it was quite a way. So there's probably 20 feet where the rain was soaking down and collecting into that uh, abrasion hole and filling into the cable. And it had a big, beautiful, brand new drip loop down by the ground block that was collecting all the water. And you could just, in my mind, I could just see this thing filling up. Um, so what happened was, it was a new drop, newish. I'll tell you, when we got down to the ground block, the connectors were brand new. Like it looked like somebody had actually been there and actually re <laughs> refitted the connectors. and. Uh, I'm not sure, but um, go to the next slide, and this says a so, million. So loops. do we need a little faucet on the bottom of the drip loops? <laughs> I know, <laughs> a little like, purge valve. A little I, hole in there. <laughs> well, yeah, this so, is no joke, you guys. So Take that. Look at the yeah, right. so I am curious on that rub, and I think you're showing it in this next picture here, Larry. Was the rub through? Could, could you see the the shielding through the rub? Yeah. And is that what you we're seeing see now? could see the shielding, but it was in perfect condition. Like, so there was no, the integrity of the, of the cable itself, other than the water jacket was in perfect condition. There was no other structural impedance problems of this cable. So just a little electrical tape could have taken care of this situation, right? <laughs> <laughs> it does say that, Brady. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't give everyone bad ideas. Okay. Don't do that. Yeah, that, we don't stick aluminum cans wrapped around uh, cracked uh Trunk cables. Either. Well, we, we recommend against it, but you know, we do see crazy things out there. So, how they recommend it? So many of those. Yeah. So anyway, we got down there, and uh, I'll give a little shout out. Uh, Jeff Milcotch, a West Division a friend of mine, he was out in the field with us, and we were all socially distanced. He unplugged this thing, and he looks, and you should have seen the look on his face. He knew we were on a mission to find water, and that was literally what he was holding in his hand. Um, when you tipped it over, it literally poured out, um, and the one thing here, you guys, and we have been hit, the guys have been running on dozens of these in the last month or two because we're trying to put together all the science and, and art on it. Most of the time, you do not actually see water at the end. We got lucky because it was a very steep incline. The place of the water ingress and the big drip loop happened to be right near the ground block. 
and uh, when he uh, took it out, it poured out. Most of the time, you don't actually see water. So uh, flip to the next slide, and this is kind of the, the proof. I happen to have my TDR because I knew that this was the only way we could um, legitimately validate, and I was expecting not to see water, but I was thrilled we did. Um, until you actually shoot it with a TDR, you cannot conclusively say there is or isn't water in it. I'll tell you, this signature the water so coming far, out of the connector was was not enough evidence. <laughs> well, yeah, but I'm saying if you don't see water, you can't use that as an indication that there's not water within a 150 foot drop. Key. Right, it can be sitting right in the middle where that uh, where that sag was, just pulling up, uh, causing all kinds of chaos. But here, one thing that's super important, and we talked about velocity of propagation. Um, in order for me to get this thing to measure out, I actually looked at the the, uh, the the drop distance marks, and it was exactly 90, uh, 95 feet um, from the cable markings. In order for me to get that thing on the TDR to measure 95 feet, I had to drop the velocity of propagation from 0.85 to 0.52. So it was a massive, massive. That's a big change, yes. Yeah. And that says a lot about you know the group delay implications and all kinds of other stuff. All right. So and this is lo and behold. This is uh, this is after you've fixed it, right? Now we're seeing a yes. nice flat spectrum of all the channels. No standing wave anymore. Yeah, that took you guys five minutes. Uh, we, even a customer was there. She said, "Oh, I really got to." I said, five minutes top." She said, "Oh, perfect. I'll do lunch now." They were so happy. The thing just was humming. I mean, look at the beautiful spectrum they have. Yeah. Um, that's about as good as you could possibly expect to have. So the and MER for enough. all channels greater than 40 dB, your OFDM yep. channel that looked like a shark tooth before is so nice and flat. And, yep. and that's the same customer that you showed before? Exactly. The level. <laughs> it looks like the, the tilt isn't as bad. It looks like the levels came up quite a bit. But uh, and that was only a year old cable or two years or whatever it was. I mean, that was, and it only had a little hole in the, in the jacket. And you changed it. Uh, Apples for apples, RG6 exactly the RG6. same cable. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Exactly the same cable. Now, did you do anything to make sure the cable doesn't rub against that that line again? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, because of the situation there, it had to go where it was, except for we put a sheath on it and a, a shrink and did a bunch of stuff. So. Right. Um, yep. Okay. Uh, conclusions. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> Um, so we'll go through, uh, I don't want to burn it. We don't have a lot of time. Uh, let's go through the science about this really fast. Uh, I love this part and I'd like to spend at least the last few minutes talking about Expo and other fun stuff, but uh, flip to the next slide, Brady. So this, we brought the cable back to the lab uh, at Wincoop in Denver. And sure enough, I did apples to apples, exactly the same cable. Uh, I set up a, um, uh, tap levels that were exactly the same or really, really close to that customer. And this approximates the customer signature almost exactly. And then an unimpaired version, exactly the same thing. So this is literally the same cable. One was two years old, one was brand new. One had a tiny little hole in the jacket and it had water soaked into it. And by the way, we capped it and uh, terminated it really tight so no water could leak out. And I was very careful not to move it too much so the water would... Um, so that's the difference. Um, and uh, th looking at it, the cable was almost perfect, except for that abrasion. Go to the next slide, Brady. Uh, here's the money, you guys. So uh, the, the good cable was over gig speed test with uh, just a regular field meter. And on that exact same water soap cable, it was 179 megabits. And by the way, I run this a couple of times, somewhere as poor as 15 or 20 megabits. And 179 was the fastest I could get it through the water soap job. Right. And the speed has, uh, the velocity propagation has no impact on the speed. It's just the fact that the, uh, the, the MER, the QAM channels themselves were so degraded that we're not getting any speed over the, the you know, they're just down basically. Yes, exactly. Um, and the other thing was the upstream spectrum was virtually unimpaired. It was just, I, I didn't point it out, but in the uh, DOCSIS telemetry, I think we gained a half a dB uh, and ICFR, no problems. Um, there's a, a tech saying uh, low frequencies can't 
uh, no, low frequencies can't jump, high frequencies can't swim. Can't swim, swim. yep. Can't <laughs> swim, and uh, that's evident uh, in, in the results of this test. So go to the next slide, Brady. This is the fun part, I love this. So I went coop, this is the freezer, it was full of ice cream and I had to make room for it and I got a tummy ache, but that's the drop <laughs> cable that we recovered. I froze it, hard as a rock, it was literally crispy, when I could hear it crackling like a, like a freeze pop when I pulled, it, <laughs> pulled the thing out. And look at this. The water soak cable froze it. The response of it was amazingly good. It wasn't perfect, but wow. Like, uh, wait till you see the speed test performance. And then literally just a couple of minutes later, probably five minutes later, because the, the test closet's really hot in there. It's probably uh, uh, in the 90s. It thought out quickly and boom, there's our signature. Um, so frozen, that same water cable was hitting a gig. And what, the second it thought out, you could see it hit 70. Uh, 70 megabits again. Um, and again, no problem upstream. So this is really a remarkable testimony to the uh, to the influence of the natural environment on our cable infrastructure. So think about all of this craziness caused by one little hole in the jacket of the cable, not even affecting the impedance properties of the cable, that water getting in, temperature, all this stuff, just all the chaos that ensues in our propagation uh, well, I, I wonder if it's not just the density of the dielectric changing, but it's also when you have water that uh, freezes, you're changing that diameter because it's expanding, right? So I'm wondering if it's a, a function of both. That's that strange, isn't it? I mean, well, yeah. So your point of you were spot on about this. I, I've gotten a bunch of comments, and we've thrown this out, and have probably ten different theories about why. But it goes back to the waveguide principles, and this was a point you made earlier. Uh, Tom Bach mentioned, hey, you know, like this uh, goes back to microwave days. Like you get water in the wrong place on the waveguide, and it's shot, but the second it freezes, it starts to work again. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that same phenomena uh, are at play here, which are still not exactly well known, but. We're getting there. It's definitely very cool stuff that you've come across. Love it. So what's the moral okay. of that story? Uh, okay. Make sure we do all of our troubleshooting or FBC captures before everything freezes. <laughs> before it gets cold out. <laughs> no, no, but now think about, but here's the other thing. Sometimes these things dry out. Uh, sometimes when it's hot, the problems go away because they dry out. There's a lot of interesting opportunity here with ML and AI, weather predicting. You know, if you can predict a rainstorm coming in, you can easily predict certain customers are going to lose service, yep. you know, and um, th there's a lot of goodness uh, to unravel here. We're just getting scratching the surface. Let's go run through really fast how we um, the, the prominent uh, concept about detection. So these are three different types of signals. Number one is an unimpaired perfect signal, not perfect, but pretty darn good. Number two in the middle is our water signature. See how it's aperiodic and it's just, it's not predictable periodicity. And number three is a very common standing wave. You'll see these from, you know, uh, bad mocha filters or leftover splitters from satellite or things causing reflections off tap ports. Very common in the drop network. Um, so our tools right now, the middle two are being picked up by our wave identifiers, but we're not discriminating uh, them properly as being water induced or traditional standing wave. We treat them the same. We treat them the same. That's the big opportunity. So go to the next slide, Brady. So what we do in digital signal processing is having only log magnitude bids, basically only the raw spectrum trace. We go in there, we take the channel reference from the channel plan, and we fill in all of the, um, all of the guard bands and all of the vacant spectrum with interpolation. So the top is totally filled in as if it were a perfect one big giant OFDM signal. And we do the same. You can see there we interpolated. You can see these weird lines where the, the spectrum was filled in. That's not perfectly accurate, but it gets us close. And then the same thing for the standing wave. And then go to the next slide, Brady. Then once we have those filled in, so the, this now represents basically a signal with no noise. And then we snip the, uh, the center 4K worth of log magnitude bins. And uh, here, this is basically the centermost chunk of the used spectrum. And you can see this, some of these weird interpolation slopes. Uh, and the same here, which is normally vacant. Go ahead and press uh, the next slide, Brady. 
Then we do what's called an IFFT or an inverse Fourier transformation. Um, it's a little tricky because it's not a real FFT because we're missing some of the uh, complex components of it. Um, but basically, if you think about this as a TDR now, the perfect signal has uh, a very high signal to noise ratio. Um, the, uh, the water soaked line has a, um, has a uh, time dispersion in it. So you can see lots of little bumps um, that basically go out in, in distance um, because that's really what it looks like in, with water in the line. And then the actual uh, impedance mismatch has a single um, dominant echo that's detectable. So if you do all this processing and look at it in frequency domain as if it were a TDR, it's actually pretty easy to say good signal, uh, you know, water, water or dispersed, yeah, yeah dispersed um, uh, impedance mismatches and one dominant echo. And so yeah, this really paints the clear picture of how you can discriminate between all three cases. Very nice. Yeah, this is like looking at a TDR where if you have put a TDR on a water soak line, it sticks out really obvious. You guys know how to, and gals, they know how to interpret that properly. Yep. Very nice. Is that it, Brady? I think that's yep, the last one. that's the last one. Nice. All right. Very nice, Larry. Very good, very good description and very good uh, discovery as far as seeing the water in that cable. Uh, it's going to be a very nice contri contribution to uh, the whole industry with what we're doing with full band capture. And it's uh, so I think we're talking before, you know, it's, it was not long ago before we were just starting with, oh, boy, we've got a few modems out there that do full band capture. And now I think, uh, you know, recently you said your number is really quite high. And, you know, same for us. We've got full band capture modems. You know, the majority of modems out there now support full band capture. So, you know, really every operator should be able to take advantage of this for the majority of their plant and use this as a tool now to find water soap cables, water soap drops. Um, and the same would apply yeah. for mainline, right? Yeah, let me sneak in a plug. Uh, absolutely mainline. Um, and mainline has interesting properties because it tends to dry out more uh, more readily. I don't know if it's because of the sun or other things. We're working on that. Um, and you detect that the same way by how many customers see the problem. Um, so it's not really, really uh, deterministic, but it's pretty good. Um, but I do want to say um, the work that's going on to do this water detection is uh, both, uh, in two parts we're doing uh, ingenious uh, Cable Labs working group. That's where a lot of the, the math and the uh, detection algorithms are being developed. And then the, uh, the SCTE PN, uh, operations subcommittee number seven for PNM uh, is where a lot of the field operations, uh, those aspects are being addressed. We're doing trials and tests and gathering data and, and working in collaboration with uh, Cable Labs PNM. So just wanted to, if anybody's really interested, hop onto any one of those working groups. We're glad to have you. Uh, and it's actually a lot easier than it looks. You could start fixing your water soak drops right away. Yes, absolutely. All right. So that's, uh, I think that's what's new in the PNM industry. Um, so next up, uh, PNM Live. Um, that is something that uh, a number of us just put some videos together and we'll be doing at Cable Tech Expo. Uh, I know, Larry, you're also doing a video for that. So uh, we did one with... Uh, a local cable operator, Comporium. Well, we did some troubleshooting out in the field. We're going to do a video for that. Uh, Larry, I know you're doing a video. Yeah, we're going to we're going to play a couple of these live uh, water soak drop uh, find and fixes with customer interviews. It's pretty exciting. So you'll see it in action. And really, I, I just saw the video raw video today. It's really cool. I can't wait to show everybody. Yeah. Um, so Cable Tech Expo. Um, Awesome event coming up for everyone that uh, will be able to attend virtually, and then there's a lot of papers, Larry. That uh, I think I think we want to cover. Some, we want to plug some of these papers, right? Let's do it. You got the list, man. Read them off. Please. All right. So, um, proactive network management, cool tools to identify and eliminate eliminate impairments. Um, papers are going to be. Uh, Judy Fiera, Convolutional Neural Networks for Proactive Network Maintenance and Improving Customer Experience. Lei Zhao, a Proactive and Individual Network Management Scheme for Mid-Split, High-Split, and Full Duplex Doxis Return Path in Development. And Jason Roop, also in the chat room chatting uh, with us right now, Profile Management Informed Proactive Network Maintenance. So Profile man Management uh, PMA, highly recommend Jason's uh, one. 
to learn more about PMA, something we're also doing work on right now. Um, anything you want to cover on those? Uh, no, it's um, pretty cool stuff. This is right up our alley with PNM. Yeah, it's a you know it's a little bit more heady. There's a lot of uh, ML and AI, but it really is where we're going with all of this stuff. So uh, if you're interested in PNM and uh, how all this, these things work, uh, you're going to learn a lot. It's really uh, really excellent. Uh, another workshop is uh, turn up the software defined radio. New ways to test RF performance. Uh, authors on this are Andy Mark. Tishev, Software Revolution of Field Meters, Rob Lund, RF Testing Applications for Software Defined Radio, and Gary Ventrigla. And I apologize for any names that I'm mashing up. I'm, I'm notorious for that. Training Machines to Learn from Signal Meter Readings. Yeah, well, uh, I think, uh, oh wait, no, that, Ron Rannick is, uh, is moderating that one. That's pretty cool, you guys. So um, all of the stuff we're learning uh, you know, out there taking measurements and finding and fixing problems. When they start to tell the machines what's going on, they can start to train themselves to help us to augment uh, our tools and make recommendations and help us, um, you know, uh, get there faster. It's really, really cool work. And and um, there's different aspects of all of that covered here, but uh, that is going to be one of the most intriguing sessions for me. I'm very familiar with all the work, and I would encourage everybody to check that out too. That's going to be uh, it's all about machines, man. <laughs> so this and next session, I'll oh, go ahead, John. Mentioned a couple of times uh, ML and AI, just so people know, you know machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I'm like, I got plenty of artificial intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's all artificial, John. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this next session, I'm moderating. What does a wider upstream path mean for signal leakage monitoring and reporting? And that's uh, with John. John C., uh, Leakage in the High Split World, Ron Rannick, Full Band Capture Revisited, and Kyle Homan to a High Split and Beyond. Um, so, again, I've, I've pro pro promoted this one a couple of times now, so I do highly recommend everyone attend that one. Um, I, lo I like all the papers in there, so I, I also peer review them. I co-authored one of them, so I would strongly recommend everybody go to <laughs> Yes, definitely. Well, and if if you liked what we talked about today with the full band capture and all the new stuff, the 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 FBC revisited paper that Ron's put forth, it's got a, a lot of this in it, and it's um, but it's kind of the big picture about what full band capture is today and where we're going with it. I would really, really encourage anybody, the RF geeks who are into spectrum analysis, go look at that one for sure. But all of them are great. Yeah, and, and also in appendices in there. He put like a, a bunch of appendices and he actually exceeded the 10,000 word count. Yeah, it, was like, it was 48 pages, uh, but in there is also some code um, in order if you, you know, if you've never done full band capture before, it gives you the ability to, to go out and, and get some capture from some full band capture data from modems. Um, so again, a great paper um, that uh, there's a lot of contributors to um, that full band capture paper and that's why it got to be 48 yeah, pages as, as a uh, author myself and presenter i've always not hated but disliked to have to put the paper together because it has to be it's it's a lot of information that you want to put in but when it's done i'm happy i've done it because yes. it has much more information than what you can do on the slides i probably have i'm doing two presentations on that wednesday the 14th and uh, i probably have 15 slides in each one but I only have 15 minutes to go over them. So how much am I really going to be able to go over in 15 minutes? You know me. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, um, you'll spend paper. your 15 minutes on the intro and the uh, agenda <laughs> slide, John. Exactly. Exactly. But I, I would, I, it's a very good point, John. I'd recommend that to everyone. You know, if you go and and all you do is watch just the presentation, you're getting like 15 minutes. That's kind of like the the summary of the paper. I'd recommend everyone download the paper and read the papers because that's where all the meat and potatoes is in in the uh, of the overall presentation. The is, papers are really is detailed. Is SCTE allowing anyone to download stuff before the presentations? Probably no. not. Nope. Got to yeah. wait till. Got to wait to expo. But you, just what you said would have been nice, right? Allow people to see some of the content, read it. And then when you listen in, you get more out of it or you have more questions. But Yeah, well, got to get there and whet your appetite. So the uh, the next one is, what are our machines learning? This is Key Zhao, simultaneous echo cancellation and upstream signal recovery using deep learning in full duplex DOCSIS systems. And Rob Thompson, Comcast guy, 
uh, machine learning techniques for equalizing cable TV network nonlinear distortions. Wow. Yeah. So I'm the moderator for this one. And this is just an absolute mind. Sounds blower. exciting. Uh, yeah. If you guys know Rob, he is just sharp as a whip. Uh, known him for a long time. And Key's work are so complimentary. Because this is, they're actually solving nonlinear distortions in the plant with nonlinear filters that are created by neural networks. It's amazing. So uh, it's super deep, technical, very geeky with math and all of that. But that's your thing. And it is mine. It's a must, must see. So John, I'll let you devil, plug yours. Yeah, as the devil's advocate on that one, what could turn people off is just saying FDX. Because if no one's going to go, if, if I'm not going to go that route, that might turn me off from dedicating my time to listen to anything FDX. When in fact, there might be more about the non-linearities that have nothing to do with the FDX. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm wondering, uh, Larry, is does that presentation talk about non-linearities that can be solved with uh, full bandwidth capture or some other, or they focus on the echo cancellation of FDX? Well, no, one is focused on echo cancellation. The other is just nonlinear filters and, and neural networks. So, um, you know, there's something for everybody. Uh, I appreciate your perspective, but I care a lot about FDX. So <laughs> I, I did too for about two years. And then all of a sudden I had to refocus. <laughs> hey, and, and, and whether or not, you know, I, I don't, I think FDX is complicated and I think extended spectrum is complicated. They're both complicated technologies, so I, I, I don't think we should dismiss either of them yet. But we'll see what, what happens in the future. So, uh, John, you said you're doing two papers also, right? Yeah, For Expo? yeah so uh, October 14th, I think it's Wednesday, right? I think, it, I think it's Wednesday. Um, maybe it's Thursday. Wednesday? It's in October, John. What's your paper, John? <laughs> so I have a, one on capacity concerns and how we got where we are because of COVID uh, and how do we readdress the next event that's going to occur because it will or the new normal or whatever you want to call it there's a lot of um, applications that are creating more traffic that we didn't think about that are creating traffic we didn't know was more contention versus piggyback requests and laser clipping and all kinds of stuff so that's uh on a, on a panel with a few other people 9 30 to must be 10 30 uh, and then later on one o'clock i do the power of daa so distributed access architectures and i like I said, because I have limited time, I'm just going to focus on the power of digital fiber. Cutting your analog, you know, cut your losses. <laughs> Get rid of the analog fiber and go to digital fiber. Distance, uh, MER, performance, no laser clipping, you know, <laughs> spoiler alert, right? <laughs> I mean, there's so many things. Just going digital fiber uh, saves me. And I don't even care if you go uh, uh, remote fi, remote Mac fi. Distributed CMTS, I don't, just go digital fiber. As an RF physical guy, that's all I really care about. Get rid point. of the analog. But if, if you want to go FDX or anything cloud, you have to do that anyway. So that's the first step. Go to digital fiber. Yeah. All right. Excellent. We'll be looking forward to them. So for everyone, Expo's coming up in October. Again, it's free to attend. I recommend and as you said, Larry, nothing's free, but I recommend everyone join up and attend these sessions. They're, you're going to get a, a wealth of information out of them. So it's going to be a great, com a great event coming up. Guys, we are out of time. Larry, thank you so much. A wealth of great information on what are so cables. I'm really looking forward to seeing what we are going to be able to do from this and learn from it. John, thank you for your time. Everyone in the chat room, this was a great chat going on. Um, Jason, thank you for all the moderating you were doing and uh, uh, talking with everyone. And for those of you not using PNM, I see that in there. Please uh, definitely start using PNM. If you need any help with that, obviously contact me. More than happy to help. So thanks everyone for your time. Great episode. Please do give us a thumbs up if you like the content. Hit the subscribe button. We'd love to have more subscribers and tune in next time. Uh, we do have more podcasts coming up shortly. So thanks so long. We'll catch everyone on the next episode. Thanks guys. Yeah. John Brady. Thanks. Yeah.